Another exciting episode of What Is How To, and today I'm super happy to uh, introduce Rod Johnson, uh, the founder, co-founder of Atomist. Um, he's, uh, he's, I don't know, uh, you know, we have the odd uh, industry luminary on, but certainly the creator of the Spring Framework uh, is someone that has had a considerable impact and influence on the industry, and uh, so I'm, I'm super happy to have him on the show today, and um, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, CI/CD. And um, yeah, what Rod's up to. So um, yeah, hello, Rod. Hi, James. Always great to talk to you, and thank you for the kind words. Cool. So um, yeah, I think that normally we do a what is how to, but with you, we decided to do it slightly differently, and to talk, I think, about what is broken um, rather than just how to fix it. So what are you gonna what are you gonna present to us today? Well, today I'm fundamentally going to talk about bad animal analogies. So I'm going to start with the frog. Consider the frog. You've probably heard the old uh, story about the boiling frog. 19th century biologists were convinced that if you gradually heated the frog, you gradually warm the water up, the frog wouldn't jump out as the water was brought to a boil. Modern biologists, I must say, I like being honest, full disclosure, modern biologists don't believe this is entirely credible. But this whole idea has become quite influential, right? That you can gradually get into a situation that isn't where you want it to be. So my fundamental argument today is that's exactly where we are with CI and CD. So we've ended up in a place none of us would have wanted to be because we haven't noticed things getting worse and worse over the years. So a CICD was a fundamental advance for our industry. It was fantastic when CI first appeared, but it was a very different world. Back then, we had a very small number of very complex builds. So you know, we might have a handful, even in a large enterprise, of multi-million line applications. The builds were very complex. They were all very different. It's totally different today. Enterprises have hundreds, even thousands of relatively small applications. And that old approach of a pipeline per application really isn't working anymore. So let me illustrate why it's broken. Let's ask a simple question. How do you change delivery across a thousand services? Imagine, for example, that there's a new business requirement, say post Equifax, to run Black Duck security scanning or maybe Sonar Cube uh, quality scanning across all of your services. Imagine, for example, you need an additional manual approval gateway in turn before you can go to staging or production. Unfortunately, the answer to this rather simple question is not very good because typically what you will try to do is you'll go and hunt down your build pipelines and you'll discover that you've, in fact, got a thousand of them. And when you look at them, you'll see that there is massive duplication. I'm not particularly picking on Travis here. The, I mean, you know, most of the um, CI tools will give you a similar result. This is something that I picked from what we used to do internally in Atomist when we were using Travis. This is one of our um, YAML files. And that's only part of the YAML because it doesn't fit on the screen. And it's actually accompanied by a very large amount of bash mm -hmm. so you've got a massive amount of duplication across these repositories which means that if you want to make a change globally to all or many of your projects you really are going to find that quite difficult you're going to have to do an estimation job come back to whoever, whoever raised that business requirement and say hmm this is going to take a while and also you've got to um, face the fact that the people who are required to make that change I'm really going to hate life for quite a while after you know tracking down hundreds or thousands of build scripts. So we're supposed so to have is... we're supposed to have configuration as code, but instead we've ended up with a sprawl of of, of horrific scripts. Exactly. What we've done really is ended up in our delivery flows with a situation we would never tolerate in our code, right? If we had that level of duplication in something fundamental to our applications we would say, uh, this is crazy, right? We, we're computer scientists, or at least we like to try to practice computer science. We don't accept 
that amount of duplication. So I'd say one of the things that's fundamentally broken is we accept things that we wouldn't accept in other parts of our daily work. And there are other problems. So, you know, it isn't actually code. YAML and Bash or whatever build tool DSL is fundamentally untestable. Like people test it by changing it, seeing whether their builds and delivery flows fail. It's also not particularly modular because if you come up with your own DSL or you know come up with some yet interpretation of YAML, you've got to invent modularity for scrap from scratch. That's not very good because we've actually spent 70 years of computer science and modern programming languages have a level of modularity that goes you know, way above what beyond what you can get say with um, YAML and Bash. So I would say that one of the other problems is there isn't enough computer science here. So I think it's time to fundamentally rethink delivery, to question why, like the frog, we're just, we haven't jumped yet to a new paradigm because I really think we need to do that. And so do you, what think, is wrong? Do you, do you think the industry is ready for that? I mean, uh, admittedly, as you say, the, the frog is boiling. Um, it, it's turning into, uh, you know, I guess it's not soup because we haven't mashed it up, but you know, the frog is boiling, but we've only just sort of made the change to uh, a testing, uh, a testing first sort of approach. And um, I think, isn't there going to be a lot of pushback from you know, people that have said, well, we've got CI, CD working. Well, why do we need, you know, what, what's wrong with it? I think it really depends on who you talk to. So we are predominantly at Atomist talking to enterprise uh, customers. And they really don't need much persuasion of this because they're living with it every day. Every day, they literally have more services. So, you know, they're getting into the hundreds or thousands of services. They're encountering these problems. And, you know, whenever delivery requirements change, which they do quite frequently, they face this yet another time. If you talk to people who have, you know, just a handful of services, they're probably less um bothered about the present reality but you know i think that it is very clear that with the microservices trend and just in general there is a trend towards more and more finer grain services and you know as that happens more and more organizations encounter these kind of problems okay so it's the you know we've turned everything into a game of, of cluedo problem um yeah, we've created a lot of challenges with um, finer grain services. I mean, obviously, we, we went that way to solve some problems that we had with monoliths, but we've created a lot of new problems. Okay. Well, tell us a bit more about um, policy as code then, Rod. So fundamentally, the idea of each service or project having its own individual pipeline misses a fundamental concept. And that concept is organization level policy. So for example, if I've got a thousand projects, I've probably got, I don't know, 700 spring break projects, 200 node projects, and you know, a few like, um, like dogs and cats. So I don't actually have a thousand pipelines. I actually have probably four or five delivery flows. And that is the set of delivery flows that should exist in my organization. It's really an organization policy, not a per project policy. So we believe at Atomist that it's time to think bigger. And we need to have this concept of organization level policy. We need to bring in collaboration as a key element. And even more important, we shouldn't think of CD as something that kinds of grows out of pushing your CI pipeline tool beyond its comfort zone. We should think of it as a special case of a more general automation solution. Okay. Let's think of some of the other problems that, um, that need automating. So you know, many of us have heard the uh, contrast between cattle versus pets, right? Where um, we think of our microservices as cattle, so we don't give each deployed microservice the loving attention that we give to that cute little spaniel. So, you know, we, we will take it and kill its pod and be absolutely ruthless in how we operate it in production. But the reality is that this applies not only in the delivery flow as well, it applies to the code. 
So we want to get to this level of industrialization that we practice with cattle. And in fact, many times when we work with our code across many services, we discover that we're doing things by hand in a kind of pet mode rather than this scalable cattle mode. So let's take, for example, you're using spring bait. I believe many people are using spring bait. Um, how many versions, if you've got 700 or 1,000 spring boot services, how many versions of spring boot do you have? The answer is people generally don't know. And as we know from Equifax, what you don't know in this class of thing can hurt you pretty badly. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you're trying to keep these things up to date, you've got to, again, track down many projects and edit them by hand. So you know, that's another example of something where we really need more automation in this new world. So how do we fix delivery? We believe at Atomist that one of the fundamental problems that we have is as developers, we don't use our core skills to solve our daily problems. There's an old um, saying that shoemakers' children go barefoot. And you know, the meaning behind that is that people don't necessarily use their core skills to help themselves or help those closest to them. And as developers, our core skill is writing hopefully great code, and we don't really use that to help our delivery scenario. To do that, we really need an API for software. APIs are pretty awesome things. If you think about the things that as a developer you can um, engage with that have APIs, there's an API for Google. There's an API for just about everything we interact with on the web. There's an API for modern cars. In fact, there's an API for modern refrigerators. The internet of shit, as API. they call it. <laughs> exactly. Yes, I'm not saying that all of these APIs are great, but there is fundamentally something actually magical, which is if you give developers APIs, you unleash creativity. So, for example, think of all the startups that are possible through mashing up, you know, the various information sources that are available via API today. So when you give developers APIs, they can create pretty magical things. We need that kind of thing for software. So the big ideas behind Atomist, there's really three big ideas. The first is replace the duplicative build pipelines with an event hub. So how do you apply that organizational policy across all or many of your services? Run events on those services through a central event hub, write once, apply everywhere. In order to do that, you need to underpin your automations with a sophisticated model of everything that's going on around your projects, like builds, um, pushes, commits, uh, issues, um, deployments and also going into the code. What is the nature of the code in these particular projects? Thirdly, bring back the computer science. Don't do things in a mishmash of, you know, YAML and Bash when you um, discover things you can't do. Use a real programming language and benefit from 70 years of computer science. So that's really the big idea. Um, behind Atomist and you know, we think that those ideas, particularly using code and having an API driven approach, we think that that is the future to delivery and automation in general. And I think that idea is you know, significantly bigger than one company. Okay, so CICD is broken and you're now going to show us some demos about how you plan to fix it? Yes. So what I'm going to do is Come at it through the notion of organizational policy. Can you see my screen here, James? Yeah, I can. I noticed this is Slack. Um, in, 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 you know, when, when Animus started, you used to talk a little bit about chat ops and so on. Um, now it's, it's rather more of an implementation detail, although quite a sophisticated implementation detail. It's, it's really interesting. We no longer lead with chat ops, partly because as soon as people hear chat ops, they can sometimes fixate on that and not understand that you know we're actually thinking about a bigger picture here around delivery and automation right. having said that chat ops is is awesome i mean we use it every day 
with Ian Adamist, and I couldn't imagine living without it, frankly. Uh, so the fact that you can get notifications about the things you care about in the channels that you choose to subscribe to, it's, it's pretty awesome. So what I'm going to do here is demonstrate organizational policy, this bigger picture automation thing, by creating a new Spring project. So I'm just going to type in a command here that will drive what we call an Atomist software delivery machine that will enable creation of a new project. So it will ask me for some information um, and we will call this Redmonk1 and it will also ask me the group identifier, let's use Atomist. Um, it'll ask me a package, so com.atomist. And when I submit this, it's going to create me a new repository. So this is an example of a kind of policy that a lot of people in the, organize, in the enterprise care about a great deal. It's like, what is the policy for creating new projects in a consistent manner that's always appropriate and up to date? So when I run this command, it will execute against the Slack team, uh, sorry, against the GitHub organization this Slack team is associated with, and it will create me a nice, shiny new project, um, and it will suggest creating a channel for it. Okay. So here, when we create the channel, we will see activity on this project rooted to the channel. So this is where Atomist is doing its delivery work. So you can see here that Atomist has already built this thing. So this is interesting. I didn't choose to put in a CI file. In fact, there is no CI file in Redmonk 1 Master. Look, oh, no CI file. Let's have a look at what's in there. There is no CI file. Um, it's being built because my organization knows not only how to create Spring Boot projects and Node projects, it knows how to build them. Okay. So it says it's looked at the push each push against that project and it said, hmm, okay, this one's a Spring Boot project. I know how to build this. Here it's also suggesting that I might want to add a Cloud Foundry manifest. So I'm not going to talk about how this is implemented because I know we're pretty tight on time. But when I press that button, you will see my automation client, which happens to be running on my laptop, okay. doing a bunch of work here and it will give me a pull request um, on this project, which includes, um, includes the Cloud Foundry manifest. One of the important things here is how the Atomist model and API for software enables you to get into code, and query and manipulate code. So here, when I merge um, this pull request, let's, let me merge it, I can do it right here in Slack, if I want, when I merge the pull request, now that PR has hit master, something interesting will happen. See what happened here? We had auto fixes build um, and a few other things. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, um, when it hits master, more things are happening. And the reason more things are happening is because there is now a Cloud Foundry manifest in this repository. So one of the key views that we have around a model and the need for an interconnected solution is very often delivery decisions depend on what's in that repository. So for example, a Spring Boot repository with a Cloud Foundry manifest is a fundamentally different animal from a Spring Boot um, project without a Cloud Foundry manifest. Because if it has the Cloud Foundry manifest, my particular organization knows it has a policy for deploying that. So here you can see it's actually deployed it um, on local and I have not actually updated this demo since I gave a presentation to a bank in Melbourne yesterday. Um, and it is now offering to deploy it to Cloud Foundry. So let's have a look at where all these, as we call them, goals came from. Okay. And the answer is that they came from TypeScript Code. So this is using the Atomist API, which we kind of like to think of as a framework like Spring for delivery, using the Atomist API to make decisions based on this push. So for example, on any push, it's going to run code review, 
um, and run what we call auto fixes. If the if it finds a Cloud Foundry manifest in um, the project, it's going to set these deployment goals. So these are policies that work across our whole organization. To show how easy they are to update, let's add a policy um, that responds to the project and counts the files in it. So why don't we, here we've got a um, invocation, let's look at the um, file count. File count equals wait pu dot project dot total file count. You get a lot of useful information out of the Atomist model. And why don't we just address channels to in Slack associated with that to say how many files there are. Um, so let's say project at um, pu dot project dot id dot ur g dot project dot id dot url why is that not doing u dot project yeah. okay let's say project has um file count files okay so this by default is going to run on every push we could narrow it down if we wanted to um run only on a subset of pushes that we have made it run here on every push so okay. as soon as i restart my um software delivery machine all i have to do is go into um that project and make a change and we will see this reaction so it's up now it's listening so what i'm going to do is i'm going to create a new file called um town and put in the name the uh, chamber, which is the town where I'm currently at in New South Wales. So this is now causing um, a push, um, which is hitting my endpoint here. And you'll see here that it has project has 12 files. Okay. So if I ran that against any other project um, in my organization, it will get that cross cutting behavior. I mean, obviously, it's just a little bit of a party trick to count files. But imagine you wanted to link in something like SonarCube or Black Duck or you know any arbitrary check. You or alternatively, if you wanted to add additional delivery stages, you can do it in a consistent place. So you can There's, do things like you know readmes or open source licenses. We have exactly that with open source licenses. So for example. Let's say I can't remember if this repository has a license file. It doesn't. Okay, let me show you something. So what I could have done No license is, file. Bad rod. Very bad no rod. So what I could do here is I could add something like that to notify you, but I'm going to go one better. I am going to add what we call an auto fix. So this basically will run after every commit and gives us the ability um, to essentially ensure that invariants are kept. So what I'm gonna do, this is called on every push. Again, I could scope it more tightly if I want, but I'm gonna have it called on every push. And I'm going to tell it to add a file to the project called license. And I think, James, we're gonna to have to write a license. Let's write a license um evil license is you have no way of knowing what you can do with this project see you in court um it may be that um people shouldn't use projects license like this but you know hey i'm just the messenger here um so i'm going to have this auto fix that if it doesn't see a license or if it sees a license other than the evil license, okay. it's going to put the evil license in. Let's restart it. So Atomist is an event-based system. So auto fixes, you know, again, run in response to push events. We can handle events like builds, um, deployment events, even potentially things like APM events, raising issues, etc. Okay, so all I need to do is um, create a commit here. 
So I'm going to um, go and add, I'll edit the town file to, um, to include um, London. I assume you're at home, James? Yes, I am. Um, okay, so let's commit this, commit the change. So now what it's going to do is it's going to run the file count but it's also going to, in this auto fix phase, run the auto fixes. And it's going to discover that this project doesn't have a license and it's going to um, put a license in. So the reason that went red there is because it tries, if an auto fix is applied, it tries to stop downstream flows uh, because you don't want to be, you know, if you know that you had to make an order, made a change, you um, don't actually want all those steps to take place. You can see here, if we um, go through the Atomist interface, we'll find exactly um, what change was made. And here is um, this file. And guess what? I have now created the ability to ensure that every single one of my projects has an evil license file in it. So, I mean, obviously, I could also apply that transformation across all my projects in one go. Mm -hmm. But every single project is guaranteed to have that file. Uh, so, you know, hopefully this gives an idea of the power of the model and the power of code. Because if you look at the things that we do here with our project API, we've got integration with parsers like Antler, obviously regular expressions that goes without saying, mm -hmm. you know, there's a whole bunch of really neat stuff that we can do because guess what we're not trying to pretend we're programming in yaml we're actually using a real programming language in a real module system because i mean there's a ton of stuff out there in the npm ecosystem okay well i could see tons of interesting possibilities there i mean i, I know that you're really excited about uh you know developers and what they're going to be able to do um so um yeah that's super interesting uh you know, I'm not sure we completely kept the time, but that was a pretty pretty quick romp uh, through the Boiling Frog and the demo. And uh, if anyone wants to know more, um, Atomist, um, you know where to find them. Use the internet. Uh, so, Rod Johnson, uh, thank you very much and have a great day.